introduction. It's Charles Hoskinson, uh, who is a co-founder of Ethereum. In addition to that, he is a founding member of uh, Input Output Hong Kong, uh, which is working to develop a third generation cryptocurrency called Cardano. I hope that you will all join me in giving him a warm welcome to the Start Engine Summit. We're very excited to have him here today. Different time. 
My first Bitcoin meetup group I signed up for had two people who registered for it, myself and another guy. And I showed up, and the other guy didn't. <laughs> so I had a great conversation with myself about my love of Bitcoin. It was, uh, it was a bit schizophrenic, but that's okay. So, uh, so anyway, uh, that was a really wild westy time where no one particularly cared. We didn't even think about regulatory compliance because even the regulator didn't care about us. And every now and then they'd throw some guy in jail because they had to, but come on, it was a crazy, weird time. Then 2013 came by. And 2013 actually was a big momentum change for us. You see, the point of Bitcoin was that it was a cognitive experiment for the people who played with it. This concept that you could just issue a token through some sort of decentralized means, and then somehow, some way, people would actually put hard-earned money into that. They'd actually buy it. I mean, think about how crazy of a concept that is, actually. This Anonymous hacker of the internet creates some system supposedly backed by coding math. Who knows? Most people can't read or think about it. And yet somehow, some way, these little tokens that are issued through some sort of bizarre process called mining, people will actually go and buy them. In 2013 was the moment where actually everybody said, yeah, that's a really good idea. And the markets went to about a billion dollars. That was really the first generation of this concept of decentralization, this concept of kind of a, a mass delusion that these things can be worth money. But money is a delusion itself. So then in 2013, we started saying, well, we like this decentralization concept. We like these ideas that, you know, uh, you know we can push money like email anywhere in the world. The problem is we don't like a system that's blind, deaf, and dumb. Bitcoin really is not useful. It's almost like the early days of the internet when the web browser first came up and we didn't have JavaScript. You could have these static, boring web pages, and they really weren't interactive. So the experience was whatever the developer could dream up, and that's that. The other side could interact with it. So in 2013, Vitalik and I and others, we said, hey, let's just add a programming language to one of these blockchain structures. Let's see what the heck that's going to do. Now, we didn't think it was actually going to be big. We probably would have done things a little differently had <laughs> we know that it was going to be as successful as it came. But what it did is it woke up people to this idea of programmable money, and this idea of taking old business processes, whatever they might be, the idea of issuing assets, trading assets, the concept of taking the contract and dissecting its actual intent and turning that into code and trying to automate as much as possible and putting that into a system that's time-stamped and immutable and auditable. It's a pretty cool thing if you really think about it. So, 2013. We started building Ethereum, and by the, uh, I think it was 2015, we finally launched it. We got it funded in 2014, and it changed kind of everything. That was the second generation. So then what happened next? Well, nothing for a little while, and then suddenly everybody realized this whole Ethereum thing is kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine to be an investment bank in the sky. And 2017 happened, where billions upon billions of dollars were raised by this ERC-20 mania where people would just go and issue tokens, they'd sell those tokens, and then suddenly they had $10 million, or $20 million, or $30 million. This has never really happened before, where a 22-year-old kid with no business experience and no knowledge could suddenly wake up and have $30 million and an asset, and not even a bank account, not even a legal registration. This, believe it or not, has happened in our space. And we're still recovering from this. Uh, 2018 was the sobering, oh wait, that's probably not the best idea, let's, let's take it back, but we can't here. And we're trying to sort all these things out. So what's happening in the world, because I have the luxury of talking to world leaders now, and regulators, and all these small and large jurisdictions, is we are seeing a predictable kind of polyfurcation. <coughs> people are all going in their own directions. So some people say, let's look at what the EU and the United States is going to do and say about all these tokens and all these offerings. Let's see what US regulation has to say. Some of the Western world is biased that way. The European Union is in some way the same. Then other opportunistic jurisdictions like Barbados and Bermuda and Malta and Gibraltar and the Isle of Man and Switzerland and Liechtenstein, all these nice places, some of which have more bankers than they have farmers, and they have pretty much anything else. Uh, they're saying to themselves, boy, it would be really fascinating and interesting if we can get a chunk of this market. We can't do the whole tax evasion thing anymore. That doesn't work so well. 
So let's go ahead and try to get a leg up in the tokenomics world. And we're starting to see all kinds of really creative schemes being developed. This notion of the utility token, this notion of the security token, and all these new concepts about how to do KYC and AML, and some are more permissive than others. And then we see other jurisdictions that have become very draconian. China, for example, says no way, no how. And so far, South Korea is not so happy about it. But there are strong elements of the government that do want to create some sort of a sandbox. So it's a mixed bag between whether one ought to create new legislation and regulation, as Japan did with its laws in 2017, or whether we should just cram this entire space into regulations created 80 years ago, hoping that somehow we can make them work. And there is no consensus within the world. And it makes it really difficult for a guy like me, because at the end of the day, I'm just trying to do stuff. You know, I care a lot about how do I help people? How do I build things for consumers? How do I actually make this useful to them? Because, you know, I was in Santon in South Africa not too long ago. And I had an opportunity to take uh, some cars out to the townships. These are places with 35% unemployment. Most people make less than $100 a month. And I met this great venture, and they said, hey, can you help us build a land registration system? Because right now you have this problem when people sell their land in the township, they don't tell the government. They just sell it, hand somebody the deed, and say, here you go. So when you look at the land registry, sometimes it's 30 years out of date, 35 years out of date. You know, you know how you find out who owns it? It's called the grandma test. You go find the oldest grandmother in the neighborhood, and you say, who actually owned that land? She'll tell you the whole history. You have to have about four hours and drink a lot of tea, but you'll get the whole history, usually. <laughs> and you ask the other grandma, too, the second oldest, just to make sure the ledger's right. <laughs> well, anyway, so that's kind of the, the whole thing I do. And I try not to think too much about the regulation, but unfortunately, I'm forced to. So I get asked a lot, where's this all going and what's going to happen? See, we have a lot of problems in our space. Like, there's been hundreds of ICOs issued by American citizens. And to be frank with you, you're a US citizen, but it doesn't matter where you sell your token and who you sell your token to. Somewhere along the way, the US government's going to say they have jurisdiction. You can be selling things to people in Tonga, and you can have it in a bizarre Polynesian language. And if you're a US citizen and issuing and bringing the money back to the United States, somehow, some way, a regulatory body at some point is going to say, you owe us taxes, or you should have filed some form, mea culpa. Because that's just how the world works. And the ICOs that have been issued are probably no different. Mm -hmm. What's likely to happen is a lot of them are going to get yelled at, and they'll have to say, we're so sorry, and go Reg A or some other exemption, pay a fine, and move on. The government's not crazy, but they need to do something. Regulated markets will form, like Coinbase and T0 and others, and they'll find ways to create liquidity for these instruments that were previously unregulated but are now regulated. But then something else is going to happen, something pretty magical. Somewhere along the way, people are going to start asking questions, foundational questions about basic things, like why the hell does it cost so much money to do compliance? Well, it's because what we've told these banks and these financial organizations is that they have to be God. They have to go and learn everything about you, who you are as a human being, your transactions. And if they see anything suspicious, they have to file a suspicious activity report on you, send it to the regulator. So they've been tasked with this duty of trying to figure out whether you're safe or not. You know what that does? It makes them very conservative. It makes them biased. They see someone from Angola, they say, I don't care if you're Angola's Bill Gates and you're a nice guy and you spend your weekends saving orphans. You're in a high-risk jurisdiction. I just can't open an account for you. So sorry. So then people will start asking, well, can we do these systems differently? Can we start automating things? Like what if, for example, we move to a transactional basis and it's just a collection of questions we ask for every transaction. You, know, you query against data warehouses using certain knowledge proofs. And some cryptographer somewhere would actually understand what that means. And somewhere along the way, will actually try it. And you know what? It won't be tried here in the US. It'll be tried in Africa. Because somewhere along the way, somebody in Rwanda, Uganda, is going to want to do a cross-border payment. And there's just not good systems for that. And they'll say, how about let's try this? And the government's going to let us do it. And you know what's going to happen is just like Bitcoin, it's going to work somewhere. And when it works, more people will do it. And when enough people do something, you know what happens? It changes the world. We've had many regulations in the history of this nation. Until 1992, it was illegal to sell things on the internet. 
the NSF AUP, National Science Foundation Acceptable Use Policy. They said, oh, we can't repeal this non-commercial clause in the AUP because the internet will become a cesspool of spam and pornography. And that happened. But we got Amazon. <laughs> and we got many other great businesses. And these people have changed the world as a result. And similarly, if enough people start doing something, the law will eventually change. It's malleable. That's why you see things like the Jobs Act from time to time. That's why you see things change. But here's my final point about all of this, is that I'm just a guy, and you're all just people. And we tend to think we get titles and money, and we've been in the game long enough that we're serious and prominent. But the reality is that we're only as good as the tools we have, and we're only as good as the people we serve, the customers we have, and the markets we live in. And something has happened over the last 25 years. The markets have changed in a very subtle but profound way. The reality is that you're now doing business, whether you like it or not, with the entire world. And our systems of regulation, and our systems of compliance, and our payment systems, and our financial systems aren't designed to accommodate that. So setting cryptocurrencies aside, the world has to change. We live in a country, the United States, that has had financial dominance over the world for a long time. It was us and the Soviets. That was the Bretton Woods Agreement from 1944 on. And now we're living in a world that's now no longer monopolar, it's multipolar. There's a pivot to China, there's all these factions rising up, and the dominance of the dollar is starting to recede. We're still relevant and powerful like the UK, but moving into the future, the US regulators aren't gonna have the same power that they used to, to reach into arbitrarily any country, anywhere, anytime, and tell them, hey, this is the way it ought to be, this is what you ought to do. Instead, they're gonna have to negotiate. And you know what happens when you have to negotiate? culture changes, your society changes, because you can no longer mandate. When you're used to saying, do this or else, and you have to now say, we request that you do this, the world changes. So over the next 10 to 20 years, we're gonna see great fortunes made, and we're gonna see a lot of things change. But one thing I'm absolutely certain about is that we're gonna settle upon a completely new world financial system. And what it's gonna look like is a lot of the things that are really expensive right now and take a lot of time right now are going to be completely automated. A lot of jobs are going to go away. If you're the chief compliance officer of an organization, maybe you should consider a different vocation in 20 years, 30 years. And that's probably a good thing because it's not good spending every three years the entire value of the city of Tokyo on your job. But we're also going to see money start moving at the speed of information. And we're going to see tons of financial creativity. You know, I'll close with a story about some of the things we saw in the coffee industry in Ethiopia. There's this practice called stumping. What the heck is that? It's where you're a coffee grower, and you go and chop down your tree, the old tree, kind of worn down tree. It still has productive capacity, but it's getting old. You chop it down, it regrows. And when it regrows, you get about two to three times as much coffee production from it. So why don't the farmers do it? Because they can't afford to do it. They lose the productive capacity that's money out of the pocket now in exchange for money in the future. So what do we have to solve that? Credit. When these new systems come into play, when this new world comes into play, somewhere soon, five years, 10 years, some farmer somewhere could be asking a person in this room for a loan of $50 or $100 to stump their trees, paying 20, 30% interest. That's a reality that's gonna come, and we're gonna see billions to hundreds of billions of dollars flowing all around the world, people who need it the most, with the rates and risk of that going down, and it's gonna change their lives. It's gonna make the world a much better place. Just like the innovation of our financial markets, the 19th and 20th century made America a superpower. It's gonna make the whole world rise up. So each and every one of you is part of this. We all have our parts to play, whether they be regulatory or technological or scientific doesn't particularly matter. We have a wide spectrum of opinions. The government's gonna to have to give a little bit, and we as entrepreneurs are gonna to have to give a little bit because there are problems like consumer protection issues and insider trading and these types of things, and people just aren't gonna stop being bad. <laughs> That's just the reality. We have an orange president, for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. Thank you.